Hi, Wes O'Donnell here at Commencement 2019. I'm here with Kevin Harris, Program Director of Cybersecurity at American Public University System. Kevin, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. What do you think the biggest threat to cybersecurity is in 2019? Uh, funny thing, I probably would have never thought I would say this, but a toaster. So it's just um, with the explosion of IoT devices in the home um, and in businesses, toasters, refrigerators, all these different appliances are connected. So that's one additional uh, threat that we have that probably we wouldn't have thought of even five years ago if we would have to worry about appliances and part of the security uh, threat vector that we have. Also, just the more centralized data uh, that we have, that's a continued threat that we're going to have. Uh, the awareness levels are threats that, that we can continue to see, but also our devices, um, our wearable devices and even medically implantable devices are all um, areas that an attacker can possibly look to a breach, which possibly with some of the medical implantable devices could be life-threatening to individuals. So these new technologies that we have that allow for a lot of outreach um, where um, individuals don't have to come in to a medical facility um, where they can be monitored from home and medicine adjusted. Um, these are all the um, threats that are, um, we're continuing to see. Yeah, so how do you counteract a threat with, with IoT things or medical devices? Like what's the, what's the path to, to fix those problems? Yep. I think it's from the uh, very um, inception and design of the product, you know, to have security um, in mind and limitations and even what protocols are going to be used um, to communicate back and forth between um, the locations and the actual devices. And really, the decision has to be made at some point, is the convenience worth right. the risk? Right. So let me ask you this. What led you to cybersecurity in the first place? Well, my um, IT background, I started in infrastructure, so networking and server administration. So that was kind of before we called it cybersecurity or information system security. Yeah. It was just we were setting systems up to be secure, and so it didn't have a name. So I've kind of been in the cybersecurity mm -hmm. area um, probably the majority of my career. Um, I worked as a database administrator for a while, so it was limiting access to data, um, making sure that users had access to data when they needed it. Probably initially we were doing it for efficiency when we were talking networks, um, just making sure that we didn't need to um, let users kind of traverse the entire network but to segment it. But that's one of the best security practices, but it's also for efficiency as well. So I, I know that, that companies are beginning to look more and more at uh, vulnerability assessments to try and protect their assets within the organization. What other types of contingency planning uh, would you recommend for a company trying to protect itself? Well, I think one of the big things is what you said is assets, um, asset identification. That's got to happen first. Uh, we've got companies have to realize, you know, what digital assets do they have so that they know what can they do to protect it. Um, and some of the ways are penetration testing. So hiring um, external companies to come in and look for those hmm. gaps or those vulnerabilities that they may have that they may not recognize, or even if they recognize them, might help them kind of assess the risk level of an attacker um, taking advantage of those vulnerabilities. Um, different things that um, companies can do is also when they're looking at their strategies, whether the strategies are on-premise or um, design of their network and their tools, whether it's a cloud-based or a hybrid, all of that can help them with contingency planning that if there is a um, hybrid solution between on-prem and cloud, they can kind of integrate that into some of their contingency planning that if their physical network was compromised or their physical infrastructure was compromised, right. they could roll to the cloud. When you say penetration testing, that sounds a lot like hiring a hacker to hack into your company. Are there any risks with penetration testing? Um, there, there are risks. Um, probably one of the biggest risks is that some of your internal rules that you have, especially if you're using intrusion detection or pre intrusion uh, prevention systems, that this attack from the outside, if not properly managed, could be considered a legitimate attack. And then your plans to protect your network, right. shutting off access to certain areas, could potentially be a problem. There also is some debate kind of in the cyber area of whether um, it's a good practice instead of hiring the penetration testing, our companies that um, penetrate, um, try to assess these different vulnerabilities, or also hiring hackers, if you will, 
to try to do some of the same things without having the boundaries of some of the hiring professional companies. And so that's, that's a debate, you know, then you have a risk of hiring somebody that, you know, may not have some of the best practices that some of the penetration companies have. So that's a debate sure. that's going back and forth. Sure. You know, it's, what's funny is I'm from Michigan and GM is a huge presence up there, you know, and, and really a lot of the newest discussion in cybersecurity, at least in my neck of the woods, mm -hmm. is about how to protect against hacking into a vehicle. And it occurs to me that a car really is the most expensive computer that you own. Yeah. Uh, so what are some strategies you would recommend? Well, I think one of the things is just, again, design and conception. When we talk about vehicles of what communication do you want to be made available? Yeah. You know, GPSs and mapping in cars have been around for a while, but part of that comes into play that if you've got a map loaded that's a few years old and there's a new area that you're trying to get into, right. um, your maps aren't updated. So some of the newer vehicles, um, automatically update uh, via connections that are in the car. So the thing there is the more communication path that you're opening from the outside, that's increasing the risk. You know, so right. each one of these um, communications, you know, whether you have Wi-Fi available in the vehicle, whether the software can be updated remotely, yeah. all those are introducing just another potential vulnerability. Um, so it's just um, to think about that and just consider that um, in the design, again, it's convenience, you know, versus security, right. as well as do you keep those redundant physical connections? Because when you uh, modern, modernize cars and you have the vehicles that are controlled by um, computers, um, there's not necessarily a need to have a physical connection, say, for instance, to a braking system. But right. do you make the decision to keep that for a failover or do you get rid of that um, actual connection I and mean, totally right. rely on the technology? Yeah, so I mean, it sounds like companies need to be more proactive, sort of right now the industry, at least the auto industry, is more reactive. And so, uh, just like you said, moving in that into the design phase, and, uh, and it sounds like the way to go. Yeah, and I think it's hard, hard with tech because we always constantly have to look at those that are in the tech sector, when these new technologies become available, um, when is the right time to use them, what's the right application to use them, and sometimes the decision is that we can do it, but maybe right. we shouldn't do it in a certain situation. Right, right. Well, let's switch gears real quick and talk about jobs. So what type of education do you think companies are looking for when they're trying to hire uh, an IT manager, say, or a cybersecurity analyst? I think one of the things they're looking for, for on top of, you know, they want somebody with the breadth of technical knowledge so that they can um, communicate technically and they can understand the technical risk but they also want somebody that is available to, um, they want somebody that can um, work with the business functional units to understand what the actual business is. Right. They want to critically think. So I think these additional skills on top of the technical skills are, are really important what they're looking for in a manager, somebody that can make those decisions that understand the risks that are out there. Right, and that just hearing you say that, having those extra skills, that occurs to me that that's something that veterans uh, might possess, you know, it, it seems to me cybersecurity is a, is a very uh, easy field for a veteran to transition into given that that set of, of skills. Not yeah. necessary, but but it could help. Yeah, definitely. You know, I think that's one of the kind of biggest things about the cybersecurity field is making sure that it's an inclusive field, you know, right. Um, right. veterans and other populations that, you know, we don't see a lot of in the cybersecurity field to make sure that it's welcoming, um, diverse, so that all these unique experience um, that individuals that can bring can help kind of um, ensure that the field's secure. Right, right. That actually leads me to another thing, you know, we we're talking about veterans, but there's another demographic group that's not very well represented in cybersecurity, and that's women. Yep. So what can companies do to try and attract more female talent into, into their companies? Yep. Uh, again, I mean, I, I think just having programs and recruiting and starting back from even awareness programs throughout right. the company, because a lot of time there's a misconception um, that, you know, cyber or computers, f the computer field in general is only you have to look like this, you have to have a certain skill set. But right. again, from securing um, actual servers, securing the data, securing um, um, web um, structure, securing social media, these are all you know parts of it. So there's um, 
availability for everyone to be kind of cyber warriors, if you will. Right, right. So back over to jobs or back over to education, rather, uh, how important are cybersecurity certifications as opposed to a degree program? Yep. Or should there be some combination of, of both? Yep. So it's a question in the IT field in general that's been there for years. And so I always like to say that it's not one or other. If you look at the combination of experience, certifications and degrees, right. all three of those work together to kind of show someone that's a kind of well-rounded individual. So it's not one versus the other, it's how well those yeah. three kind of work together. That makes sense, that makes sense. All right, so we had uh, this past year, 2018, some, some pretty massive cybersecurity breaches from Facebook to Uber to T-Mobile to uh, Hyatt. Are criminals just that much more advanced than these companies can keep up with, or or what's what's happening? Do these are, are these companies not prepared? Do they need to to employ more cybersecurity analysts? Well, I think one of the things when you look at what some of the breaches that you talked about, um, the issue is um, not necessarily what the companies aren't doing. Of course, everyone can always kind of um, firm up their foundation with their cybersecurity, but we're most organizations, companies, medical facilities, um, government agencies are collecting so much vast amounts of data that if there is um, a breach, it's not just affecting 10 people, it's not just affecting 20 people, it's affecting millions of individuals. So I think that's, that's kind of the landscape that we're in, that when these breaches happen, they're large scale. And I think unfortunately, because of the kind of interconnectivity of these organizations that we're going to start seeing these breaches um, continue to get larger More often, um, yeah. just be because of how much data is being stored centrally. So there is a severe shortage of trained cybersecurity professionals in the United States. What's the solution? Yeah, I think we've got to move into, and I think we've got there, is that it's a collaborative effort. You know, so right. it's a collaborative effort. How do we um, kind of... Um, shore up this pipeline of qualified uh, cyber individuals or cyber warriors, if you want to call them, uh, to protect the critical infrastructure here in the country. Right. So it's uh, collaborative between educational institutions, um, organizations, um, government entities, you know, setting policies, uh, leg setting um, legislation, passing legislation. All this has to work together and we really have to be creative. You know, what type of cyber programs are they? And I think educational institutions, um, what programs are being delivered. You know, there's um, a vast amounts of diverse uh, cyber programs and there's a place for all of them, relationships with um, the K-12 um, industry because just when um, someone gets to uh, college and they decide to choose a career path, they've made that decision possibly in fourth grade or fifth grade or sixth grade. So right. making sure that programs are available, you know, in primary and secondary education so that someone knows that it's a viable career. Also looking at alternative paths for people that um, decide that they wanna go directly into the workforce, right. apprenticeship programs, co-ops, all these. And because we wanna ensure that we have this um, trained workforce, I, I think we, we have moved and we've gotten there kind of yeah. as a country to realize that we need all these organizations and institutions working together. Um, there's work for everybody yeah. to do. You know, I think you nailed it, um, talking about catching them younger, catching them in uh, a secondary type institution. Uh, I recently visited a high school called Pickney High School, and uh, the state has actually funded this high school to be a cybersecurity training range on the cybersecurity range uh, in Michigan. And it's amazing having these, these young people really get involved in cybersecurity in high school at that age before they, they have even started thinking about college. Um, so I think you, you nailed it. I mean, that's exactly when we need to be attracting that talent. Thank you, Kevin, so much for joining us. It was great to have you here today. To learn more about our cybersecurity programs, visit us online.